good day and welcome back. So last time we were talking about um, values and how it's stored in the computer. And we said that regardless of what value you have, the computer is going to store it as a number because everything is a number to the computer. Now how you interpret those numbers is how you give rise to different type of values. And of course you group um, a certain number of bits to get higher and higher order to store more values and so on. Right. So today we're going to look at data and data type. Now, what is it, data? Data is just your value. So we're going to use data and value interchangeably. So you're going to be able to store some data, your data you need to store. It's going to be stored as some value in the computer somewhere. So from now on, data and value, same thing, use them interchangeably. We're going to look at a number of different types, data types. And we have yet to define what a data type is, but we'll see. And we're going to look at how some of these data types might be stored. Again, this is very simplifying just for illustration purposes. But once you get the general concept, it doesn't really matter how it's actually stored because you're going to be sort of in that vicinity of understanding how data might be stored in the computer. And that's what we really want to get at. Not the specific of any particular language or architecture, but just a general idea, the concept. Okay. And just as a reminder, um, here's the ASCII table. And what we really want to take away from this, from our previous video, is that if you want to store a number or a letter, whatever it is, the computer is going to represent it as some number uh, internally, which is, we're going to say, are just bits. A bit is a zero, one value, and you group those together and you get like a byte, and you group bytes together and so on. And so while this table is just about ASCII, um, there's the UTF encoding format, that allow you to encode um, different types of character, whether it's ASCII characters in 8-bit or other characters like Chinese character into 3-bits or 4-bits, whatever. So you can certainly look that up, but just know that there are other encoding formats to take care of all the other characters that in spoken and written language. Talk about data by looking at some example of different types of values or data that you might have. I have them in two columns here, right? So you can see in column one, you know, I have some values there, 5, 19, viral, true, false, pi, and so on. And you look like a date at the bottom there in column one. And then in column two, I have some more values. And not really thinking too much or knowing too much, let's assume that you don't know too much about data types yet. What if I were to ask you to now combine these, create some categories where you group things that seem similar or alike into you know their own kind of basket and so you could create as many baskets as you like and just put things that you think are related or seem similar sort of like you know the kids child um, exercise where you might ask them to group pick out the similar color things or similar types of shapes and so on so I'm not going to say that this is the only way and it certainly is not but one way you might want to group these is might you might create a group in of that light gray box there and put all the numbers in them. And depending on how much math you are comfortable with, you might um, put 5e to the 19 in the first box, or maybe you might choose to put it somewhere else as a different thing. But, and it really doesn't matter. That's the important thing. And then there you might create a second box, a darker gray box um, with the decimal values. And then uh, you might create a box with for true and false. And then another box where you put the things that look like virile and solid and orange etc to go together. You might even decide to create a separate box for the things that are single characters or you might even throw them in with you know the other larger string. But the bottom line is you would somehow come up with multiple groupings. You probably would not end up with one group and throw everything in it. And so but it doesn't really matter how many groups you really come up with. It's just that you would recognize that oh, some of these seem to be similar and some of them are not. Now that we've kind of intuitively understand that all certain things, types of values, uh, seem to be, even if they don't have the exact value as in equals, right, they, you know, 5 and 19 seem to go in the same box together, we can sort of think that, you know, these data, five, the data 5 or the data value 5 and 19, somehow share some property and that's the data type. So we're going to say, Data is just another name for value. And my definition of data type is just the formal specification or how that value is represented. And so data of the same type would be represented the same way. 
or get interpreted the same way. And there are certain operations that are legal or valid for data of the same type or values of the same type. Okay? And let me just kind of show you what I mean by that. So you, you don't quite know yet all the types that I, um, Go support or what they name, but I put some type there on the side in this table on the far left on the type. But in the middle, I showed some things, some values and operations that are probably okay. So you take the number eight, you take the number 16, and you can imagine that, you know, if you add this together, you get 24 and that's something that's okay to do. But what you may not think is okay is if you take eight and try to add it to the string 16. Like how should that really, what should be the result there? No, there are languages that allow you to do this, but in Go, it's not allowed. If you try to think through what it might mean if you have 16 the string and you add it to 8, should you create a string as the result that is 816? Or should you try to interpret the string as a number and then add that to the 8? So, you know, you can end up with some ambiguities there. And then what if you couldn't convert that string to a number? What should be the result be? Should it be adding 0 or should you have an exception or some runtime error or something? So. A language like Go is very strongly typed, and so operation between an integer and um, or a numeric value and a string is not defined, it's not allowed, okay? So there are many other examples. And so, for example, um, what if you had a number, a uh, floating point number, like 3.14, and you tried to act through it? What does that mean? That certainly doesn't seem like it would make any sense or yield anything. Or if you had true plus true, what is true plus true? Um, but if you had true and those double bar there in the OK column says true or false, means that, yeah, I can have a statement that's either true or false. So, so that's something legal to do. Um, strings, you can add strings and you'd expect to, to get string. You're just concatenating them. Um, so the plus oper operator there means concatenate. But again, if you try to do like a multiplication with string and a number, or even modification of between strings, what does that really mean? So something that is not defined. So just some example of this idea of how data type enforces operation and also give you representation. Back a little bit, and we said before that memory is just a collection of bytes, and so you can store bytes in memory, and each byte has an address. That's where you can find specific bytes and see what value is contained at that byte location. But we kind of left out something. We, kinda, we never said how does data get into memory or you get out of memory. So here's a simple illustration, again simplify, of what a memory device might look like. And so on one side of the device, you might present, there might be a number of wires, lines, and you um, present an address. And of course, since we're talking about um, electronics at a very low level, we found that each wire is just a bit or a byte, a bit value, right? So it's zero, one. And so, of course, you collect these bits together and you can get bytes and blah, blah, blah. But we can gather some number of bits representing the address where we want to read from. And remember that those number of bits get interpreted as a number. So if you put all zeros in, all your bits are zero, you're saying, I want to read something at byte location or byte address zero and so on. And so that's the, mem that's the address of the byte you want to access. And in terms of the data, where is it coming from? Well, you must have some, also some lines, um, wires, representing the data that's either coming in or going to be read from this memory device. So how does the device know if you want to store something or read something? And that's where the control lines come in at the bottom. So the control lines um, are going to say, hey, I want you to store something at this address and expect the data to come in at the data um, lines there, or I want to read something from address and I want you to put them out or push them out on the data lines. Um, but there's a little bit more to it because we have to start thinking now, as you said, we group bits together and we get bytes, but sometimes we um, also know that though if you group bytes together, you get more a larger um, representation of numbers. So we have, you know, a 64-bit value and so on, which is 8 bytes and so on. So how does that come into play here? Well, if we were restricted to just reading the value um, 8 bits at a time, you'll see that if we wanted to read a 16-bit value and we had an 8-bit device because we can only read 8 bits at a time, if we want to read a 16-bit value, we'll have to um, do you know, two reads 
Um, whereas if we had a 16-bit device, we just read it one time. Um, similarly, if you had like a 64-bit value that you wanted to read and you had an 8-bit device, well, you would have to read it eight times in order to get that value out. So you have to go to the device and say, give me a byte, give me a byte, and do this eight times until you get your 64-bit value out, right? Does that kind of make sense? And so you can see that um, if we have a device that's capable of reading, let's say, 64 bits, which is most computers today, but either 32 bits or 64 bits is what you're going to have in the market today, um, you can just say, well, okay, I want to read an 8-bit value, and you need to be able to tell it how many bytes you want to read. Or you can say, I want to read 16-bit value. So in addition to the control signal that says what I'm reading or writing, you can also say how many bytes you're reading and writing. And for most devices, like I said, they're going to be 64-bit today. And there are few 128-bit devices, but that's the highest in terms of how many batches of bytes you can read at one time. Whether it's 128 bits or 64 bits or 32 bits, um, but you can't say at one time I want to read like 100 or something. That's going to be a multiple accesses um, in terms of bytes. But you can see the efficiency there now as you can able to read multiple bytes. And it's certainly much better than if you're just reading one byte at a time, um, if you were restricted to just reading one byte at a time. So, okay, so let's take a look now at when we have data of a certain type, how that might be stored. Again, this is for illustration purposes. Now, if we imagine the uh, Boolean type true and false, we know there are only two possible things for that um, type. And so an 8-bit value is more than sufficient to store that. So if you're storing Boolean values, you may say, well, false, I'm going represent, to represent that with 0, and 1, I'll represent it with through this true state. And so you might look in memory, and imagine we can go look, poke around in memory, we might see something that looks like this, where at certain memory locations, we have 0 and 1. And if we were to read those as, remember, when you read as a certain data type, you're interpreting it, so you interpret those bytes. Uh, we're going to interpret that to mean either true or false. Even though we have more than sufficient bytes there to represent other things, for the particular case of Boolean, all we're going to say is that 0 version false, and one represents true. And if we try to read a byte location that had something other than zero and one, maybe it had 10, for example, we can make a decision depending on the implementation of the language. You might say, well, is that true or is that just unknown because, and then throw an error or something. But that's beyond this conversation. The, the general point here is that if you're trying to store a Boolean value and you go look at memory, and we agree that 0 and 1 is how we represent it, that's how you might see things. An example, we might say we want to store some numbers in our uh, memory device at a different byte location, but now we're only storing very small numbers, and we're going to say that all oh, these numbers can fit into 8 bits. None of them is bigger um, than 255, which is the max for our unsigned 8-bit value, or none of them is bigger than 120 minus 127 or positive 127, and hence it can certainly fit. And this is how we might see that and interpret it at each byte location in memory, if it's just 8-bit value stored, which is just one byte. If you have some larger values to store that we know are going to fit within two bytes, regardless if it's signed or unsigned, you know, we're going to choose the appropriate type then. Again, here's where we're going to store them in memory. And notice here our values occupy two bytes regardless of how small it is. So even though 0 could fit in an 8-bit value, but because we say 0 is going to be stored in a 16-bit value, it's still going to occupy that 2 bytes. And minus 10, again, can store into an 8-bit value, but because we said that this minus 10 is a 16-bit value, it's going to occupy 2 bytes. And so when we read memory, this is where we'll be specifying that we want to either read or write 2 bytes at a time in order to get the proper representation and storage for our value. Okay, for illustration purposes, again, let's consider how we might store string and characters. So let's say we want to store a string. A string is just a sequence of characters. And we can agree that the first byte, set of bytes are going to be the size of that string, and then the remainder is actually going to be the characters. So we might say that, oh, you know what? For all our strings, we're going to use four bytes to store the, how many Byte um, characters are in the string. And we might say, well, you know what? We want that to be a 32 bit value, so hence four bytes. Now, 
if we are reserving four bytes for just uh, how many characters are in a string, notice that if we were to start storing a string at the location memory address 10, that the first four bytes starting at 10, 11, 12, and 13 are just going to be the four bytes that we need to, you know, represent our number. And then if the string that we're storing are ASCII characters, you know, still using eight, UTF-8, but UTF-8 can represent characters in either 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit, sorry, 8-bit, 16-bit, uh, 24 bits or 32 bits, so you know, one byte, two byte, three byte, four byte. Um, if it's ASCII character, we're just going to store one character per byte. And so, if you want to store something like Veril, the first four characters are going to say that this is just six, um, six characters in length string, but then the six characters are going to follow that. Now, on the other hand, if we're going to store Chinese characters as our string, and even though we only have two Chinese characters, um, those first four bytes of our string are going to say, oh, there are only two characters in this string, but each character, let's say, takes up three bytes. So now we need six additional bytes to store those two characters. And so total bytes for our string is always going to be the four for the length, and then, you know, how many bytes we have, how many characters times the number of bytes we allocate to each character. Um, does that kind of make sense? I know it seems like a lot. Now, when I say so, um, when we read and write bytes, it's important to tell the memory devices how many to read and write at a time. I don't really mean we in Go will have to do that. I was talking about if you were, you know, writing assembly language code to actually do this. The Go compiler is smart enough to issue the right instructions based on the type you use to say that, oh, oh, I should read two bytes, four bytes, or whatever. So you really don't have to see this. So the, the you I was talking there is a very abstract, high, um, low-level user who's interacting with the processor. So again, don't. this is more for illustration to give you an idea. We're going to get into seeing how you define different types and go in the next video. I kind of wanted to give you a feel of memory and all the different types arise and how they might be stored and so on. I think you're going to, with this information, it'll make you a better programmer. So if you haven't seen this before, I hope you find it really interesting. If you don't quite get all of it and grasp all of it yet, don't worry. Look at it again. And then as we go through the course, maybe over with repetition, you'll kind of get it. So that's the end of this video. I hope you learned something. Thank you for your time. Take care and bye. See you in the next video.